All right, if we could turn, please, to the book of Esther, chapter 4. We'll take the time to read the entire chapter. It's only 17 verses. It begins this way in chapter 4, verse 1. When Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and a bitter cry and came even before the king's gate, for none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews, and fasting, and weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told it her. Then was the queen exceedingly grieved, and she sent raiment to clothe Mordecai and to take away his sackcloth from him, but he received it not. Then called Esther for Hatak, one of the king's chamberlains, whom he had appointed to attend upon her, and gave him a commandment to Mordecai to know what it was and why it was. So Hatak went forth to Mordecai unto the street of the city, which was before the king's gate. And Mordecai told him of all that had happened unto him and of the sum of the money that Haman had promised to pay to the king's treasuries for the Jews to destroy them. And he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given at Shushan to destroy them, to show it unto Esther and declare it unto her, and to charge her that she should go in unto the king to make supplication unto him, and to make request before him for her people. And Hatak came and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Again Esther spake unto Hatak, and gave him commandment unto Mordecai. And all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king into the inner court who is not called, there is one law of his to put him to death, except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter, that he may live. But I have not been called to come in unto the king these thirty days. And they told to, Mod uh, they told to Mordecai Esther's words, then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Then Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer. Go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast ye for me and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise and so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded him and again god will bless that reading from his precious word and of course a very obvious title for this session this morning is if i perish i perish because that really is the the kind of key line uh, that highlights what's going on in this chapter some have suggested this chapter is a weak foreshadowing of the great tribulation uh, when Jews indeed will be in mourning as a decree will be issued for the wiping out of the Jewish race uh, once again. Very interesting that the background to verse 1, where we read about Mordecai uh, rending his clothes, putting on sackcloth, is what we saw in the end of the previous chapter, where uh, this horrible decree uh, to execute all the Jews in one day had been signed by the king and had been sent by posts and they had taken this this evil message this message of death and destruction uh to destroy to kill to cause to perish all jews and they had run swiftly 
with this message and taken it throughout the empire. And isn't it in somewhat uh, a sad reflection that we have also been given a message from the king uh, to spread throughout the earth? And it's not a, a gloom and doom message. It's a message of life. It, it's a message of hope. It's a message of victory over death and the grave. And tragically, we have been somewhat ponderous and slow in delivering this message. And we need to ask ourselves, why? What's the issue? Is it, the, the king has issued the decree. Uh, the decree is to be all authority is given uh, to me on heaven and earth. Go ye therefore. The decree has been issued by the king. And yet the problem is not with the decree. The problem is with the the postman, as it were, the posts are slow in delivering that message. May God help us to run swiftly with the message of Christ and him crucified, buried and risen again, the only hope for a world under the sentence of death. So it tells us that, that Mordecai and the Jews, we're going to see in this early section, were devastated uh, and great mourning. Uh, results wherever this decree was published. And so it, it begins in, in verse 1, Mordecai perceived all that was done. He rent his clothes, put on sackcloth with ashes, and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and bitter cry. And of course, I, I, perhaps part of it is Mordecai's grief was so intense because maybe he felt personally responsible for what was happening. It was, after all, his obstinate refusal to bow to Haman and the confession of his Jewishness that had now brought this trouble on all his people. Remember back in chapter 3, verse 4, when uh, they, he was being pressed to know why he wouldn't bow, it says, Now it came to pass when they spake daily to him, and he hearkened not unto them that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matter would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. And so his confession of his Jewishness and his refusal to bow really is what had started this whole thing. And now this decree is gone. And you can imagine him feeling not only grief because of the decree, but de grief because of his personal involvement. He is, if you like, the lightning rod. He is the, uh, the start point of all of this, uh, this hostility. And now what he's doing is telling the whole city by wearing sackcloth and ashes, by mourning uh, through the city. He's telling th the whole city, not only that was he a Jew, but he was opposed to this murderous edict. And basically he is showing his colors that he's devastated by this. And of course, uh, in the in the East, the Orient, Oriental fashion in times of great lamentation was to rend their garments and to put on sackcloth and ashes. And this has uh, happened uh, in the East uh, from as early as Genesis. Uh, the first reference we have to it is in Genesis 37, where we, we read this in Genesis 37 and verse 34 on the supposed uh, news of the, the death uh, of Joseph, it says, and Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. And so that's the first mention of it uh, when he rent his clothes, wore sackcloth in mourning for the supposed death of Joseph. But it became a common form of expression amongst the Jews and is referred to several times in the Old Testament. We don't have to exhaust every reference, but we'll just look at a few uh, just to see that this was common, both Old and New Testament, a way of expressing grief and devastation. So the first reference we want to look at is in the prophecy of Isaiah and chapter 58, Isaiah chapter 58 and verse 5, where again we read this expression, is it such a fast that I have chosen, a day of man to afflict his soul? Uh, as Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush, to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast, an acceptable day to the Lord? Uh, verse uh, Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 26, and just references to this idea of 
fasting and sackcloth and ashes. 626, O daughter of my people, gird thee with sackcloth and wallow thyself in ashes. Make thee mourning as for an only son. Most bitter lamentation, for the spoiler shall suddenly come upon us. And of course, Jeremiah warning of what's about to come, uh, the Babylonian invasion. He tells them, put on sackcloth and ashes, mourn like you've lost your firstborn. Daniel and his uh, great prayer in chapter 9, uh, where he prays a prayer of confession and repentance on behalf of his people, including himself in it. And it tells us in Daniel 9, verse 3, and I set my face to the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. We don't have to turn there, but remember Jonah when he brought his message to Nineveh. And what did the king order? He ordered that everybody put on sackcloth and ashes and mourn and fast and get the attention of the Lord. And then one more reference, a New Testament reference in the gospel by Matthew chapter 11 and verse 21. Matthew 11 verse 21, it says, Woe unto thee, Chorazin, woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. So what, what is this sackcloth and ashes? Well, sackcloth was a coarse black cloth made of goat's hair, and it was normally used in the making of sacks. It, in other words, it was, wasn't used for fine clothing. It was made to make sacks with, and it was coarse and hairy, and they would put this on, and then they would also put ashes on their head as an outward sign of inward grief and sorrow. Uh, Mordecai would, would indeed have been a sorrowful sight walking around uh, the, the capital city looking like this. And it kind of reminds me in our, some of us that grew up in the Roman Catholic Church on uh, what we used to call Ash Wednesday. And it was the first day of Lent. And we would go to Mass and the priest would put ashes, sign of a cross on ashes on our forehead. And, uh, and again, I, I guess perhaps it was from this, a, a time of mourning and affliction because uh, it begins the period leading up uh, to Easter. And so you can see where the Catholic Church get these, these traditions, not that they have any New Testament warrant whatsoever. I, I'm just mentioning that because it, reading this passage reminded me of going forward and getting the ashes. And of course, I went to a Protestant school, so it was kind of a, it really kind of marked you out as different. You were, you, you were wearing uh, uh, no sackcloth, but you had ashes and it marked you out as different. What's interesting is that uh, he, he's not just uh, accepting the edict. He is protesting publicly in a sense, mourning in a very public way, uh, this terrible edict is going public with it, marching through the, the capital city. And again, it just is interesting. Uh, one person said this, all that is required for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. And we're reminded of the words in the book of Proverbs, and we just read it from Proverbs 24. And, and it's challenging, really, that, that sometimes I think we, we just accept things and we we don't show any sense of mourning or disquiet for what is going on it says in um, proverbs 24 11 and 12 if thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn to death and those that are ready to be slain if thou sayest behold we knew it not doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it and he that keepeth thy soul doth not he know it and shall not he render to every man according to his works? One of the things that comes to my mind is that when sin occurs in the local assembly, how do we respond? When there's a discipline issue, Paul says to the Corinthians, you ought rather to have mourned. There should have been mourning that this thing was done among you. And sometimes I think we just, we just, take these things in our strides, and we're not moved by them, and we should be. 
And so certainly Mordecai shows his, his grief in a very clear way. He is not happy with this decree. And he is going throughout crying up with a loud and bitter cry as a result of this horrible decree. Verse two, it says it came even before the king's gate and came even before the king's gate, for none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. Remember, he had that position at the king's gate, but he couldn't go there now because he's wearing sackcloth and ashes, because the idea is that nobody uh, should ever uh, show any unpleasantness uh, in the presence of the king. It would intrude upon the king to show such upset and unpleasantness in the king's presence. And we, if we just go back to the book of Nehemiah, uh, you'll see that same idea that these kings didn't want to be disturbed by anything that would perturb them or uh, cause their, uh, their happiness to be uh, affected by somebody sad. And so in Nehemiah 2 and verses 1 and 2, it says it came to pass in the month Nisan and in the 20th year of Artaxerxes, the king, that wine was before him. And I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had, I had not been before time sad in his presence. Wherefore the king said to me, why is thy countenance sad seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid. Why was he afraid? Because you're not supposed to look sad in the presence of the king. You've got to have a big smile on your face and you can't show any kind of sadness or grief or unhappiness in his presence. And so that was the case. So he couldn't come into the king's presence uh, Mordecai or into the gate, lest the king uh, should see him in that condition. But notice verse three, it says, and in every province, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews and fasting and weeping and wailing and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. And you can imagine the drama of this event in every place where this decree had, had come. And you, you see the Jews laying down and, and wailing, basically, because of the, the implications of this decree. It meant the wiping out of the Jewish race. So verse 4, it says, So Esther's maids and the chamberlains came and told it her. I guess news travels fast and even though Mordecai didn't come to the gate, word of him in the city had reached into uh, the, the, the chamberlains, uh, and they told it. Uh, and it says, then was the queen exceedingly grieved. That's very strong language that is used here. This exceedingly grieved, it literally is writhed in pain. Uh, she, she is just agonizing when she hears of... Mordecai's sorrow and she doesn't know why she has no idea why why is Mordecai walking around dressed like that we can't tell if these chamberlains knew of the blood relationship between Mordecai and the queen uh, they may have known that he was her guardian but remember her Jewish identity has not been made known at, up to this point and so She's very grieved, and what does she do? Well, she she does what she knows to do. She sends a change of clothes. Uh, she's concerned, first of all, about him being found near the king's gate in that condition. Uh, she's trying to protect him, and so she does what seems to be the most logical thing for her, sending him fine clothes to put on, lest the sackcloth uh, arouse the concern of the king's officers and guards. And so she's trying to protect him. But Mordecai is not interested in a cover-up. He wants a cure. <laughs> Just covering up his mourning, he's not interested in that. He wants a cure. He wants this dealt with. He wants things to be put right. He wants a solution. And sometimes uh, in local churches, we try and cover things up. But when we cover things up, he that covereth his sin, what does the scripture say, shall not prosper. We can't have a cover up. 
uh, things must be dealt with and must be dealt with in a right way. So she calls this man in verse uh, five, then called Esther for Haytak, obviously a, a trusted chamberlain who had been assigned to her. And so she calls for Haytak, one of the king's chamberlains whom he had appointed to attend upon her and gave him a commandment to Mordecai to know what it was and why it was. You've got to find out what is the cause of this deep distress? What is going on? So she sends this man, Haytak, to find out what is what is going on. And really, this little section, verses 4 through 9, is where Esther is going to learn of the decree and where the fact is going to begin to dawn on her that in the providence of God, he has placed her in a position where she may be in a position to help her people. And I wonder, one of the great fa failings of many of us is to fail to grasp what we're capable of doing for God if we realize that he has placed us where he's placed us for some divine purpose. It would never have entered into Esther's mind that she was the one person on earth who could save her people at this time. Even Moses was slow to accept that he was God's instrument, that he had prepared to go to Pharaoh and deliver Israel from slavery. And so we need to ask ourselves, do we realize why we are where we are, why God has placed us there? And do we understand that he has a purpose, a divine purpose for our lives? Of course, Mordecai's request would ultimately cause her to reveal her Jewish identity. identity. And so Mordecai wants her to make this request before him for her people. The king perhaps didn't know that she was Jewish. This is going to lay it all out, and it would require a great brave and bold declaration on her part to show her background to the king. And so this is the kind of background we have here. People under the threat of death. These were her people. What is she going to do about this? So Haytak takes this message and it tells us that Mordecai, verse 7, told him all of all that had happened to him and of the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay to the king's treasuries for the Jews to destroy them. And he gave him a copy of the writing of the decree, which obviously now is in circulation around the capital, that was given to Shushan to destroy them and show it unto Esther and declare it unto her and to charge her that she should go in to the king. And notice this, to make supplication unto him and to make request before him for her people so now as it were the cat is out of the bag Mordecai has let Haytak know that these are her people it's no longer hidden now not only was uh, as we're going to see here the king of Persia sheltered from seeing sorrow and hearing bad news he was also to be protected from all interruptions that might interfere with his pleasant life. And so Esther sends a message back with Haytak to Mordecai and just points out this little difficulty that she would have in going into the presence of the king. And so we read in verse 10, again, Esther spake to Haytak and gave her, him commandment unto Mordecai. All the king's servants... And the people of the king's provinces do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king into the inner court who is not called, there is one law of his to put him to death, except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter that he may live. But I have not been called to come in unto the king these thirty years days so of course this is verified by one of the the great historians herodotus 
who, who said this Persian custom that anyone approaching the king uninvited would be put to death unless pardoned by the king. So again, history confirms this was the situation. The Persian kings had surrounded themselves with a strict barrier, which those unsummoned dare not pass. Of course, there were different reasons why the restriction of access to the king. Firstly, it was perhaps primarily for the king's protection and security. Although ironically, as we've already mentioned, this particular king uh, would be assassinated by one of his courtiers, one of his trusted courtiers would kill him. But nevertheless, generally speaking, it was a security thing, the security. And again, it would be the same today. Uh, if you was, were to go to Buckingham Palace and try to walk in and see uh, King Charles, <laughs> uh, you wouldn't get very far unless you had a specific invitation because it would be perceived as a threat uh, to his royal person. Same with the president of the United States. Secondly, a, a second reason was it prevented the king being disturbed by plaintiffs with minor problems invading the king's privacy. He shouldn't be bothered with those kind of things. And thirdly, it created a kind of sense of awe and reverence and majesty that not everybody could come uh, just as they wanted into the presence of the king. It's kind of shrouding him with this air of, of superiority and, and majesty and awe. At the back of Esther's mind must have been the king's dealings with Vashti. Remember, she didn't go <laughs> when she was summoned. And now Esther is being asked to go when she wasn't summoned. And she knew how it worked out for Vashti. And so there's a, there's a genuine reason for apprehension and fear in her mind. To save her honor, Vashti lost her crown. To save her people, Esther risked losing her head because of the law of the land, which stated that you could not approach the king unless he'd asked for you to be there. Isn't it wonderful that we can come into the presence of our king, that, that as it were, the scepter is already out, <laughs> that we can come boldly to the throne of grace, to seek grace and help in time of need. The Lord Jesus said, come unto me, all you that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We have an invitation to come as often as we like into the very presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. What a wonderful privilege it is. But that was not the case for these earthly monarchs. You just couldn't march into his presence. And of course, Esther said, I haven't been called for 30 days. After five years of marriage, maybe he was uh, losing some of the, uh, the fascination that he'd had with Esther. Remember, he's a a man who has many concubines. Maybe he's looking elsewhere at this time, and Esther's not being called for 30 days. And so she's she's concerned. What happened to Vashti? I haven't been called for 30 days. This is, the king obviously doesn't want my presence. And so all of these things are at the back of her mind. She's concerned. Um, she's concerned about her person, <laughs> Would her petition be rejected? Would she be, would she be killed for doing this? This is a very real and serious threat. And so verse 12, it says, they told to Mordecai Esther's words. So verse 13, then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, think not with thyself that thou shall escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? So Esther, obviously, she's concerned about her own welfare at this point, more than the welfare of her people. She's concerned, if I go in, I'm, I may lose my life. 
And yet, Mordecai reminds her that if the Jews are going to be destroyed, don't think you're going to escape too. You're a Jew. It will get to the attention of the king, and you will be also a victim of this edict. And so the Jews are, are, are linked together. They're all together, just like we're linked together in the body of Christ. Uh, we're, we're identified together and identified with Christ. They were identified as Jews. And he tells her the queen's palace would be no safer than the Jews in the provinces. All the Jews, without exception, were by this decree sentenced to death. So Esther, in one sense, has a twofold death sentence on her head. She has the death sentence of the decree. All the Jews are going to die. And then she has this second potential death threat if she does go in to the presence of the king unbidden. And so there's a potential of a double death threat on, on Esther. And in a sense, isn't that true of, of us, that we were under a, a double death threat? We, we were separated from God. Uh, because of sin, because of the fall. So we were we were dead spiritually, and we were in danger of a second death, a death eternally, because of our state. And it was only because of Christ that we have been delivered from this twofold death threat. <laughs> the separation from God, we now can enjoy intimacy with God through the Lord Jesus Christ and eternal separation from God, we will never perish but have everlasting life because of the marvelous work of our Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. But right at this moment, Esther is under this double death threat. So Mordecai says, and speaks as one who has no doubt, notice his faith here, no doubt about the final outcome, how this is all going to work out. What he states is this, that deliverance will come from another place. Verse 14, if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall there a large enlargement and peace come sorry, enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. And so he has no question in his mind that deliverance will come. Mordecai knew the promises of God. I'm going to bless those that bless you. I'm going to curse those that curse you. Through you, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. He also knew that the promised Messiah was going to come through the Jewish race. They couldn't be wiped out because Messiah would not be able to come. He, so with absolute faith, he says, deliverance will come. But he's saying to Esther, deliverance is going to come from another place, and you're going to miss the glorious opportunity. The opportunity that, that you have to be instrumental in this deliverance. And it's good to realize, isn't it, that when God determines he's going to do a work, He's going to do that work. And we can be part of that and enjoy the privilege and the blessing. But if we choose not to, he'll get somebody else to do it. And we'll miss the blessing. God is not uh, restricted by our reluctance to do his will. He'll just get somebody else. And so it's good to ask ourselves this. Too. Are we seizing the opportunity that God has given to us to serve him in our day? to be instruments in deliverance, in bringing deliverance from death through this life-saving message, eternal life message of Christ and him crucified. God will still get his work done. But we will lose the blessing. We lose the vibrancy of our walk, the joy of service, the opportunity of being used. We'll miss all of that. We'll lose out, but God will get the work done. 
some of us have experienced this at the remembrance meeting where we've had an exercise about maybe a certain hymn or something we we felt uh, needed to be brought before the Lord in worship and adoration. And because of nervousness and apprehension, we've stayed silent. And somebody else has got up and said the very thing that we intended to say. God intended that through the spirit for that to be said. And he wanted us to do it. And we miss the blessing, somebody else. And in other ways too, we can miss great blessing. Maybe we need to recognize that we've been brought to the kingdom. For such a time as this esther needed to recognize you're in this place as the queen of persia for such a time as this god in his providence has put you in this incredible position and there's a reason for that and the same is true of you and i wherever we are whatever our position is god has put us there for a reason and he wants to use us and he wants to use us for his glory and his honor. This is really the, the classic passage of the providence of God. This great statement that you've been brought to the kingdom for such a time as this. It's a wonderful thing. The queen is all, everything that's happened up to now has been for this moment. The exaltation of the queen. It's been God's purpose to put her in that place that she might be instrumental in saving her own people uh, from the certainty of death. And so Mordecai confronts her with the options. Going to the king would involve the risk of death for her, but refusing to go would still mean death for her and for her father's house because she's still a Jew. And she would miss that glorious opportunity. Another place. From the, another place, deliverance will come. Some see this as a veiled reference to God. Remember, God's name is not mentioned. But the fact that deliverance will come from another place ultimately refers to the fact that God will raise up an instrument of deliverance. So he's some great principles here. God has divine purposes to accomplish in this world. We know that. He has got purposes to accomplish in this world. God accomplishes his purposes through people. He uses human instruments to accomplish his purposes. God will accomplish his purpose even if his servants refuse to obey his will. He'll get somebody else to do it. And God is not in a hurry but will fulfill his plan in due time. And so what can God do for us? If we don't fulfill our purpose, well, he can set us aside from his service, just put us to one side. Like Paul didn't want to be made shipwreck. He didn't want to be put to the side, put on the shelf. Or he can discipline us to get us to do what he wants us to do. But one way or another, his will will be done. But oh, how much better when we cooperate with the Lord in doing his will. In verse 15, then Esther bade them return Mordecai, this answer. So there's this coming back, back and forth, this dialogue going on. And so here's Esther's answer. She says in verse 16, go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast ye for me, neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise. And so will I go into the king, whether which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. So the first thing she says is, will you get everybody fasting for me? Now, again, remember, prayer is not mentioned in the book at all. God is not mentioned in the book. But, but by implication and by inference, usually when people fasted, they prayed. They they always go together. And so, and, and again, another just an interesting aside, this book up to now has been full of feasting. The opening chapter, we had this long feast, six months of feasting. Uh, Haman 
getting together, feasting. It's it's feasting all the way through. We've got some more feasts to come, Esther's feasts in the next chapter, uh, the, the Feast of Purim. There's lots of feasting, but but here, right at the kind of core moment of the book, there's a call for fasting. And we, we, we need to recognize, in one sense, it's true that many in our assemblies, there's lots of fasting, feasting, but there's not much fasting going. We're, we're a people who love to meet together. Oh, how good when Christians eat. I mean, meet. But when we meet, we often eat, right? And there's lots of feasting, but very little fasting. And here we have this call for a fast for three days. And it's set in contrast to all this feasting. Even the king and Haman, they they feasted once the decree was signed. So we've got this stark contrast. And what's the purpose? Well, it's part of it is to avail of access to the presence of the king to intercede on behalf of those who are doomed for destruction. <laughs> it's quite a picture, isn't it? Interceding in the presence of the king for those who are doomed to destruction. And this is, in a sense, something that God has given to us. We're to intercede. Uh, I will that prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks, uh, supplications, prayer, giving of thanks be made for all men. Why? Because God will have all men to be saved. That's the reason. First Timothy chapter two. And we need to intercede on behalf of those who are doomed to destruction because of their present plight. Esther is the only woman in scripture who was called upon to risk her life for her people. Entering into the king's private quarters was not according to the law, but her resolve was conditional. She says, I'll do it, but first, please get everybody for three days, three nights to fast. Even her chosen maidens, maybe some of them were proselytes. We don't know this, but they too were going to fast for this period of three days. Now, again, we said there's no specific reference to prayer, but usually these go together. And I wanted just to show you from scripture, how these two things always tend to go together, prayer and fasting. We're going to look at just a few references just to see this. We'll begin in 1 Samuel, uh, where we've already been in our studies, but uh, but we see 1 Samuel chapter 1. Again, here's a, a woman, and uh, she's concerned about the barren conditions that she sees, and what does she do? 1 Samuel 1, verses 7 through 10, it says, and as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore, she wept and did not eat. Then said Elkanah, her husband to her, Hannah, why weepest thou? Why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? And am not I better to thee than ten sons? So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now Eli, the priest, sat upon a seat by a post in, of the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. So here she is, uh, Hannah. She's fasting. She's weeping. She's in bitterness of soul. She's praying to the Lord. Prayer and fasting going together. Second Samuel chapter 12. We have the story of David uh, over the son that Bathsheba had uh, conceived and had born to him. And in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 12 and verse 16 and 17, we read, David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth, and all the elders of his house rose and went to him to raise him up from the earth, but he would not, neither did he eat bread with them. And what's David doing? He's crying out to God, praying and fasting, uh, seeking God. Uh, Book of Ezra, again, just a marvelous uh, example of this practice of prayer and fasting going together. Ezra chapter 8 and verse 23. Ezra 8 verse 23. 
where we read this. So we fasted and besought our God for this, and he was entreated of us. We fasted and besought God. And, of course, we've already seen the example of Daniel in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verse 3, uh, where we tied it in with sackcloth and ashes, but he also fasted and prayed uh, in that very same verse, Daniel 9, verse 3. It says, and I set my face to the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. So many examples in the Old Testament. Why don't you just look at one, please, of, of great significance um, in the New Testament. And it's in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 17. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 17 and verse 21. Matthew 17 and verse 21. <clears throat> well, let's just uh, kind of look at the context. Um, uh, somebody, uh, well, verse 15. Um, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and saw vexed, for oftentimes he falls into the fire and oft in the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief, for verily I say to you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove and nothing shall be impossible unto you. And then verse 21. Now, by the way, let me just say this. Some of the more modern translations that are greatly influenced by the critical text of Westcott and Hort, three older manuscripts that don't even agree with each other, wildly disagree at times. Uh, I believe spurious manuscripts, Gnostic manuscripts, they do not have this verse. But 99.9% .9 of all extent, extent manuscripts have this verse. How be it this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. In other words, there, there's some demonic strongholds that are so entrenched that it requires something more than just prayer. This kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. And so and back again in Esther chapter 4, the very fact that she's asked people to fast three days and three nights would, would infer prayer is required as well. And so she says, uh, verse 16, go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast ye for me and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also, my maidens will fast likewise. And so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded. So she says, fast for me for three days, and then I'm going to do it. I'm going to do what you ask. I'm going to go in. And if I perish, I perish. In other words, she was, she was willing to die in order to save her people, risk her own life for others. A simple but sublime, courageous statement of resignation to God's will. If I perish, I perish. The Apostle Paul said this, I die daily. The Lord Jesus says, if any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And then the Apostle Paul said this, in Acts 20, verse 24, he says, None of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I may finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify 
to the gospel of the grace of God. Notice what he says, neither count I my life dear unto me. And maybe if we were more like Esther and took the attitude, I've been brought to the kingdom for such a time as this. And if I perish, I perish, but I will seek to do the will of God and deliver those that are doomed to destruction by bringing the good news to them. Oh, how we would desire that we would have the same clarity in our understanding that God has brought us to the kingdom for such a time as this. And if we're going to be fruitful, we're going to have to die to self, to ambition, to our own life, and be willing to live for the Lord Jesus as living sacrifices. May God encourage us with these thoughts. Amen.